This discussion and today's talk is about ornaments and how they are traded and how they are used in cities and settlements of the Indus civilization. The ornaments that are preserved archaeologically, which are the preserved materials of, of decoration, are only part of the complex of ideological and economics, economic systems that are used to identify individuals and differentiate them at the same time. So ornaments are used to make people look different but they also are used to help people integrate and look the same amongst certain communities. And this is an important pa pattern that we need to help, need to understand and need to identify archaeologically. We also need to remember that there are many perishable aspects of ornamentation that we do not see. So we're only seeing the tip of a very big iceberg. And we have textiles, we have hair decorations and braiding and tattooing and many other aspects of ornamentation that are not visible and we need to develop more detailed ways to try to gain that information from the archaeological record. These forms of ornamentation are used to differentiate people by religion or ideology through social hierarchies as well as for economics. Uh, the technologies and the styles of ornaments that developed in the Indus, I argue, are indigenous, meaning that they did not come from somewhere else. They were not originating in other regions. They developed indigenously. And yet, at the same time, the Indus civilization and the Indus tradition were not isolated. There were connections to Central Asia, to Arabia, to uh, North Africa, to Mesopotamia, and Central and South India and eastern parts of South Asia, as well as even possibly as far as China. So we need to keep in mind that there are lots of connections that were happening uh, over a long history of, of the region. The places where people used ornaments include cities and rural settlements, and the source areas for the raw materials were found in the hinterland. These all form a network of trade that moves raw, move raw materials and finished ornaments to producers and consumers. Now there is a, we'll discuss a little bit more about urbanism later on, but it's important to understand that the context of use of ornaments that we're going to be talking about is focusing on places where people are congregating, where they're interacting, where they are uh, meeting each other, and those are the cities and rural settlements of the Indus. The networks, however, have a very long history. And they begin, I believe, in the Paleolithic. Urbanism later as on, people were moving from from later on, areas it's important to, to understand that the and context of the use of ornaments of rocks and raw materials were, were, were beautiful. And these patterns of trade became solidified during what we call the early food producing era, when people began settling down, and then continued to expand and become more elaborated over time. But they have a very long history, and people were, have been moving across large, long distances to gain specific materials for a very long period of time. There's no evidence that the people who were moving into settlements and moving into cities of the Indus civilization were doing that because of climate change. They were not aggregating in specific areas for, for climate change, or nor were they aggregating as a form of protection due to conflict. So we don't have evidence for major conflict occurring between communities, and they were not living in these settlements for protection against warfare. But settlements and walled cities do protect people. So we have to understand that they did have a function of protection, but it was not so much from overt conflict, but rather banditry and probably lawlessness that occurred in the areas that, uh, that were less inhabited. So one of the major benefits from living in a walled city or a town or a village was having the safety to produce, to trade, to wear valuable ornaments that were essential for ritual ideology. And one of the important points that I want to emphasize throughout this talk is that ornaments are not simply um, economic. They have a ritual value, a ritual importance that we cannot really identify for the Indus, but they were probably, that was probably the most important part of them, meaning the, the, meaning, the, the use of these ornaments. Ornaments would have also been used to reinforce hierarchy and status, as well as economic status, but I think that ritual is one of the key elements that we need to emphasize. 
Uh, the overall chronology, what we were talking about, I'm not going to go into detail here, but basically we'll start from the early food producing era, about 7,000 BC in the, south, in, in the regions of the Indus Valley, and then continue on through the early Harappan or regionalization era, the Harappa phase, and then the late Harappa phase. Um, these are the, the main periods that we'll be talking about. And this is the also c can be correlated to uh, um, periods in Oman and the UAE, as well as in Mesopotamia. The earliest ornaments that we see during this transition, during the early food producing era, are found at the site of Mehergar. And Mehergar was excavated by the French archaeological mission, uh, Jean Francois. Um, provided a lot of these images for me, and I want to thank them for their support over the years. This, this burials in Mehargar were filled with ornaments, and this is an important pattern that we see starting at about 7,000, but it disappears after a while. So it begins in the early Neolithic, but later on people did not put ornaments in the ground. So it's important to understand that there was a transition and change in the use of ornaments for burial in the Indus region. So the Neolithic period, early period, we see ornaments in the graves, but in the later periods, they were not put so not so many were put in the graves. But these ornaments come from many different areas. So we have lapis lazuli, we have turquoise, we have shell from the, the coast, and they provide evidence for long distance networks, distance networks that were linking people over great distances. Uh, lapis. Turquoise, lapis comes from Badakhshan in northern Afghanistan, turquoise from Iran, the Kona shell would have come from the coast. All of these regions are 800 to 1,000 kilometers away from Mehagar. And these ornaments were produced in the distant regions and brought in finished form to Mehagar at this time. So they were not made at Mehagar. We also see the presence of large bangles. And so Mehagar is the first place in South Asia, where we have evidence for the use of a bangle, a circlet that is used as an ornament on the wrist. And this was made from the shunk, or the turbinella pirum, which is a very specific shell only found in South Asia. And it's something that was becomes diagnostic of later cultural traditions in the region. So this um, burial from Hadgard has the wide bangle made from a single shell. These bangles are important, and I'll be talking about bangles throughout this lecture, as well as beads. The difference between thin bangles and thick bangles is something to import, is important to note. So wide bangles are made from one shell, whereas thin bangles are made from slicing a shell using special technology. That way you can have multiple bangles. Based on ethnographic studies, the people who wear wide bangles are usually people who do manual labor, who, can, uh, who, ha who can't afford to have their bangles breaking, and wide bangles don't break very easily. And we see examples of this at Harappa, wide bangles, but also thin bangles. We also see wide bangles being traded from the coast all the way to Central Asia, Tajikistan, as early as the early Harappan period. Um, Bangles that were wide were often re repaired and uh, recycled. And even in the early phase of the occupation at Harappa, we have thin bangles and wide bangles, which indicate a difference of community. Some people were wearing thin bangles and some people were wearing wide bangles. So Mahargar is located inland, and yet it shows evidence for long-distance trade networks that link to the coast for the, the shell for making bangles, other shells coming from the farther coast, possibly even from Oman, across the Gulf. We have lapis lazuli from Badakhshan, we have turquoise from Iran, and we have carnelian coming from Gujarat. So these areas are bringing different materials across this vast area so that people were linking to distant networks to gain materials. Now there are red stones that are available in certain parts of Baluchistan, but they are not as beautiful as the carnelian from Gujarat. There are shells that are white along the coast here, but they're not as heavy and big as the ones from the, 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 the Makran coast near Balakot, so, or from Kutch. So people had specific reasons for trading materials over great distances. And I argue that these reasons 
have a very strong foundation in ritual and ideology, that these were important for people to practice certain religions and certain ideological uh, practices. Now, even though the burials at Mehrgar have many um, ornaments, the figurines, the first figurines that are found, do not have any ornaments at all. But the technology of clay making of figurines was very simple, but over time we see the figurines developing more ornamentation. So clearly ornaments become an important part of social identity and also ritual identity that was important for identifying different communities. Um, ornamentation can also be seen not just in physical preserved materials such as beads and bangles, but also in decoration. And the decoration of the figurines that has been preserved show that red colors such as the shindur put in the middle of the forehead on figurines from Mehargar was also a part of ornamentation. We see red painted on necklaces of male figures. So this may be carnelian beads or it may just be shindur. We have painted motifs on turbans, suggesting textiles with special designs. So all of these ornament ornamented styles reflect ideologies and then differentiations amongst communities that were used to help identify specific people. Seals, which we often refer to as button, seal, button seals, were probably also ornamental and they would have symbolic meaning. These were like mandalas where you have a geometric design that represents the cosmos or some ideology. And these designs are also found in furniture. We have inlay from Mahargar, we also have it from the later Indus period. And these were made in shell or in white stone. So furniture would also be decorated in these ways to reinforce the ideology. Moving from Mahargar to Harappa, we have evidence at, in Harappa at the Ravi phase of thin bangles and wide bangles. We have beads made of carnelian and lapis. We have terracotta beads showing a hierarchy. And we have swastika symbols on bone, which are similar to ones found later on Indus seals, which indicate that these ornaments also contained ideologies that were presented and visible through the, to, the, to the public. And the Ravi phase is around at Harappa 3300 to 2800 BC. Um, another very important ornament that we see beginning in this early period is the tika. Now tika is a very distinctive ornament only found in certain parts of South Asia. Not everyone in South Asia wears this, but in Rajasthan, in Gujarat, in the Punjab, certain communities wear this symbol which indicates marriage status today. The earliest tika is found in the, the Ravi phase at Harappa, which is a hollow clay object looking, look, that looks like a flower. And we also have these bangles, both thin and wide bangles, made of shell and also of terracotta. Uh, the, shell, the, the beads are um, made from carnelian from the Ravi phase. Some of them are made from Amazonite, which comes from the north. The carnelian comes from Gujarat. And we also have steatite or soapstone beads that were fired, specialized technologies for glazing. And we have the earliest evidence for fans. Uh, from the Ravi phase as well. So this is the, some of the earliest fans found in the Indus Valley. So technologies were developing to create artificial materials as well as to modify um, natural materials in very uh, unique ways. The study of these materials has been done by Randall Law and now by me and uh, or Laura Dusibio to study the patterning of where these objects come from. Randall Law de de determined that the steatite from Harappa during the early phase comes from northern Pakistan in the region of Hazara. And recently, our analysis of the carnelian from the Ravi phase at Harappa indicates that m all, the, all of the carnelian comes from a source somewhere here in Gujarat. So that means that people from the Ravi phase were getting their carnelian from this region and manufacturing beads at Harappa and uh, developing this trade networks to bring raw materials. During the Cote Dici phase, when we see the beginnings of urbanism, we have cities developing that become walled. And the earliest walled cities uh, can be dating to around 2800 BC. And it's this time when we start seeing uh, gold ornaments being used and developed. And on figurines, we see evidence of textiles and designs 
And we see the continuity of bangles and necklaces and tikka on the figurines, which indicate that communities were continuing to a, a tradition that had started in a much earlier time period. Uh, Remanderi is a site in northern Pakistan excavated by um, the Peshawar University and the Department of Archaeology, Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. And at this site, they have found numerous carnelian beads and also lots of lapis beads. Uh, we were able to study the Remanderi beads with laser ICPMS, and these beads, carnelian, also come from Gujarat. The important thing about the technology, however, is that the pecking technique which is found everywhere in the Indus and basically the world, um, is found on some beads from, from Remanderi, but Remanderi also has the earliest evidence for straight cylindrical drilling, which indicates the use of a specialized stone drill. This is a constricted cylindrical stone drill. So this would be um, possibly the earliest use of the ernestite drills. Now the question is, where did that drill come from and who developed that technology? This is something that we still need to uh, work on in the future. Moving back to Harappa, we have evidence for more elaborate styles of bangles, uh, gray bangles, design bangles, painted bangles, indicating hierarchy within the ornament use of bangles themselves. And we can compare Harappa with other sites. So if you look at the figurines from Naosharo, which is in Baluchistan, the figurines look different. The way that the ornaments are worn are different. The style of headdresses are different. We do not have figurines like this from Harappa during this time period. So clearly there were regional styles of ornamentation developing in the Indus, and more study needs to be done to try to map these out to help understand the, the different regions and the styles of ornaments in each of these areas. But they were using bangles, they had beads, they had textiles, but they were using them in slightly different ways. During the DG phase at Harappa, we see continued use of many resources from the north, but also an expansion to the south and more types of re resources coming from other, other regions of the Indus Valley. So as people begin to use the resources locally available, they were expanding and trying to find new resources. And this reflects a competitive economic system where people are trying to you know, gain some access to new materials and then compete in a, in a market. Um, this is also when we see the first walls being developed around settlements. So the Ravi phase, we don't see any evidence of a wall around the site, but the site was divided into two sectors. By the Kot Diji phase, the site becomes walled. It's one wall around this part of the settlement and one wall around that part of the settlement. And I argue that these walls were not for defensive purposes, for warfare, but for control of economics and control of production of materials that people would be trading and using. They also had a protection against bandits. They had a way to control access into and out of a site. But the fact that two wall settlements are right next to each other indicates that these settlements were not fighting each other, but they were competing with each other economically. Um, at Mohenjo-daro, we also have the same situation. So here we have a very high mound on the west and then lower mounds on the east and recent research uh, on materials that were actually excavated in 1964 shows that the corings done here and the excavations done here in, in 46 um, show the evidence for Cote Dijian settlement beneath Mohenjo-daro. So this site also would have the same development that we see in Harappa. So basically, whether it's Mohenjo-daro or Harappa or Dolavira or Rakigari, the main cities of the Indus Valley were all developing along a similar trajectory, and we see the development of shared ideologies across the broad region. Ideologies relating to ornamentation, but also expanding to food habits, and also the ways in which people were living and then organizing their settlements. This regionalization phase is the area that we need, I think, the most work for in our studies of the Indus civilization. So which regions contributed which aspects of the ideology that became solidified during the Indus period itself? Um, Carnelian comes from Gujarat. So is this the region that developed technologies for bead drilling with ernestite drills? Conch shell bangles come from all along the coast between Makran and also Gujarat, 
which region develops the technology for sawing shells to make bangles? Steatite is found up in this area. So is this the area where we see the development of steatite technology? These are questions that I keep asking myself and trying to understand. And what we knew, need is more, more research, more analysis of materials from these areas dating from the early Cotedigian phase to help us understand the answer. Because by the Harappan period, all of these areas were integrated together into one relatively uh, uniform uh, tradition of technology. But we have to understand that those technologies probably had their origins in one or more regions. By the integration phase, we see all of the settlements have big walls. Some of them have gateways in multiple uh, sectors. We have transport that connects them through the, through the overland as well as by the rivers. We have standardized weight systems. We have similar ornaments in all the cities. We have a, a writing system. This is a period of integration when these cities became integrated and people were moving back and forth between the cities, marrying between the cities, and trading between the cities. This integration era also extends into Iran and the southern regions of the Makran area, also to Oman and into Central Asia, and into the Gangetic Plain to the, to the east, and also beyond Gujarat down in as far as Diamondbad into the areas of Maharashtra. So we have a broad expansion of Indus communities. Uh, the area of Rajasthan also probably had some interaction, but not so direct. The cities themselves um, were highly organized with multiple walled areas that I argue were for control and economic control. And they were not used for fortification, but they were maintained for 700 years, and the gateways were maintained. Outside the gateways, you have sarais where people can stay overnight if the gates are closed. And marketing was done in the cities. There's also probably marketing outside the cities. And we also have evidence of people living outside the walled areas. So not everybody had to live inside the cities. Some people chose to live outside uh, the walls. And these are things that need to be uh, better studied in the future so that we can understand who was living inside the walled area and who was living outside the walled area. The same pattern can be seen for Mohenjo-daro and other settlements. We have large sites that are currently being destroyed by a modern development, such as Lakanjadaro, which is as big as Mohenjo-daro. We have sites such as Dolavira, which um, have been very uh, well excavated by the archaeological survey, Dr. Bisht. And then we have many smaller sites being studied by the uh, MS University and Deccan College community, these archaeologists. So these help us understand some of the variations in these regions, which I think will be covered in this conference this, today. Rakigari is also a very important set, site, which has two villages on top of it. It preserves a great deal of information that we need to understand. And these cities will help us fill in some of the gaps that we have in our knowledge of the Indus civilization. The cities were ruled by people. Um, we don't know who they were, but there was clearly some ro role of elites in ruling these cities. And I'm not going to get into the details of this, but um, I want to emphasize in my talk that this was a hierarchical society. It was not a just a group of people running uh, in, a, in a very loose uh, social organization. There was hierarchy. And there were people who had control. And the people who had the most control were probably represented by the unicorn. And the symbol of the unicorn was probably a very important symbol of their identity. We have clear use of this of writing for the for use of on seals for trade. We also have writing that may have just been used for symbolic purposes. And we know that the Indus writing system was used to write other languages, which we can see in the Gulf. Uh, standardized weight system, which had multiple varieties of weights. This, the cubical weights are the most common ones, but we also have truncated spherical weights, which were in the same weight system. So having two styles of weights, I feel, represents two different merchant communities who were controlling and involved in economic activities. Uh, these these uh, weights are also probably used primarily for taxation um, in conjunction with trade. 
we have very few evidences for co conflict. In fact, there are no depictions of people being killed or conquered. There are no images of rulers. And even though we have weapons that could have been used for killing people, the absence of swords is a very clear indicator to me that there, the type of warfare that was found in Mesopotamia and in Egypt was not happening in the Indus. Now, you can kill people with spears and arrows, and they were very effective at this, but the absence of swords indicates uh, the absence of certain styles of warfare that were common in other regions, including China. We also know that no Indus cities were destroyed by warfare. So cities and settlements were safe places. They were places where people could live, could practice their uh, trade, and could exchange materials and wear ornaments and use involve in their, in their rituals without fear. Now, outside the city may have been a totally different story, and that's something that we would have to deal with in a different lecture. We know that there are multiple levels of exchange. We have local exchange around the cities. We have exchange between cities. We have exchange between the Indus region and outside regions, and then even long-distance exchange as far as Mesopotamia. So all of these are different types of exchange networks that I've studied over the many years that I've been working on this. And I won't go into great detail here, but basically we have a very complex hierarchy of exchange patterns that were used to reinforce the ideology and the use of ornaments in the cities. There are types of boats on the rivers. We have carts that were on overland. And we do have indicators of people coming from outside areas to the Indus. These are seals from Central Asia, a sealing found at Mohenjo-daro, and then an Indus sealing on the other side. So Mesopotamia, I mean, uh, Central Asian traders came to Mohenjo-daro and pressed this seal into clay. We do not have any evidence of Mesopotamian traders, however, coming to the Indus cities. So the ornaments provide an important window on the culture by demonstrating the efforts expended in creating objects that are public symbols of identity, of gender, of wealth, of status, and of ethnicity. And almost in all contexts, ritual would have been important. This is just a drawing that I did many years ago showing figurines with different styles of ornaments. The tika is found in the Harappan period as well, and many different styles of headdresses and turbans for women many styles of ornaments. The male ornamentation is also quite extensive, including textiles and children with ornaments on, different styles of headdresses, different ways of wearing your beard. Uh, all of these things are important parts of a style that would have been pre present within the Indus cities. Beads are one of my favorite topics, and Harappan beads are highly diverse. They include natural colors that have been enhanced by heating. They include artificial designs created through technology. They include beads that have been colored by dyeing to make them black and white. And then just natural colors of beads that are very hard to drill, but they have developed a technique for perforating. Um, the artificial technique that the Indus developed was also something that spread throughout the world. So we know that this technique was not simply used by the Indus people, but we see it in Iran, we see it in Afghanistan, we see it in Central Asia, and it eventually spread to many different regions. In terms of um, studying the beads from Harappa, we've been able to identify that most of the carnelian from Harappa came from Gujarat, like I mentioned earlier. But we do have some carnelian from Harappa that is not from the, in any source that we know of. And currently we are expanding our sources, and right now we have 21 sources that we are analyzing. And these beads, we still are trying to figure out where they came from. So we are in the process of doing that, and maybe I will be able to present that in the future. Um, Harappans, however, did not bury their dead with, with ornaments. So unlike the Neolithic period at Mehergar, by the Harappan period, the burial of ornaments was not done. There are very few ornaments, five beads with one woman, one man with three beads and a long bead, uh, necklace of steatite beads. But otherwise, the figurines with all of these ornaments indicate that all ornaments, or most ornaments, were taken off the, the, the living person and given to the children, given to somebody else. They were not put in the grave with the dead. And this is a pattern that is very different from what is seen in Mesopotamia. So ornaments had 
value. They also had probably ritual value, and they were not necessary to be put into the grave with the dead. And the trade of Indus ornaments goes beyond the Indus Valley uh, to Oman, to Mesopotamia, to Central Asia, and we can trace this through various um, uh, stylistic forms as well as understanding the technology. So in Oman we have evidence of Indus style beads that are drilled with Indus drilling, both stone drilling as well as abrasive drilling, and the carnelian is coming from Gujarat. We have another site, Salut, where we have beads that are Indus shaped, Indus drilled, and again the carnelian comes from Gujarat. So we can identify that Gujarat or Western India is the main source for the carnelian for these beads. We also have beads in Oman that are coming from Iran. So Iran has a different type of carnelian, and this is a very important study that we just finished with a site called HD1 in Oman. The site of HD1, four beads that we found come from Iran, and three beads come from South Asia, meaning Indian sources, Gujarat. Just by looking at this photograph, you can see the color is slightly different. And I want to especially thank Massimo Vidale for the source of many of the Iranian geological sources, because with those data now we can really differentiate between Iranian carnelian and carnelian from Gujarat. Now, Indian carnelian has a wide range of color too. So you have light red and dark red. So there are many different forms. These are, these are from Kaparvanj, these beads here, or these are carnelian source. Others are from Ratanpur, some are from... Mahurjari, we have beads, 20, uh, eight sources of carnelian from the Indian subcontinent, and these are areas that we can see is a wide range of variation. So further studies will help us identify which of these areas were sources of carnelian at different times in history. We can also identify that carnelian styles of Indus beads were traded further to the west. So from Ur, from Kish, from um, Turkey, from Troy, from uh, Greece, and, and even from Israel, and even in Abydos in Egypt, we have Indus beads going. And we will be re reporting the results of these studies that we've done on Kish uh, later on, uh, we, as well as Tel Hesi, which is in, in, in um, the Near East. Um, the figurines that we see the wealth of the Indus, the ornaments were, were the people were very wealthy. Some of some people were very wealthy, I should say, with silver, with gold, with carnelian, with bronze, with toe rings, um, and yet this stuff was not put in the ground. This one collection was found in a jar at the small site of Aladino near Karachi. So this was a, a wealth of one person, but it show it represents some of the the, the largest hoard of materials found in any Indus site. And it, it's clear that Indus, some elites were very, very powerful. And some of those women with Indus hairstyles might have gone to Mesopotamia. So we see in Mesopotamia figurines from Mari that show women wearing what could be Indus style headdresses. The site of Mari also has many carnelian beads. And we show that many of the carnelian beads from the Indus were also found in Ur. In contrast, we know that they are, we also have um, figures of men with ornamentation. Uh, many of the ornaments have fallen off the figurines, but men had ornaments as well. And the, the most important designs that we see in stone, uh, it's hard to tell what the ornamentation is, but we do have gold headbands that we found in the hordes, and one of them has a decoration on it. These hair, head dressing with braiding also indicates that men's hair was a very special a task to ornament it, meaning you had to braid your hair in a certain way. Some of the hair on the back is also braided. So there are many different styles of male ornamentation as well. And then the so-called priest king, the figure shows, has a hair ornament, which is a gold bead with a white steatite center, which would have been an eye motif. Again, ritually important design. And the textiles themselves also have probably ritual significance. Gold ornaments um, I don't have time to go into great detail, but I wanted to show some examples. This is inlaid with gold and faience of two colors. One is light blue and one is dark blue. We have uh, turquoise and amazonite and vesuvianite and patterned uh, jaspers and then microbeads of gold. So they were making microbeads of gold as well as steatite. 
And this blue bead is faience, it's not turquoise. So very elaborate technology for the elite ornaments, which were very different from what is found in Mesopotamia and Egypt. And the hierarchy of bangles is also important. And one of the important features of bangles is that some of them were inscribed. So inscribed bangles leads us to a whole different, or the ornaments were also inscribed. And this is a gold ornament, which has an inscription on it. There are two of them. And some people have argued that these are pens for writing. I have studied them in great detail. They are not pens. They are hollow. The end is sealed. But when you, I had replicas made. And when you make a replica of this and you hold them together, they make a very beautiful chiming, ringing sound. So I think they were ornaments that had a sound as well as writing on them so that these would have been very elite ornaments worn by somebody at Mohenjo-daro. The bangles, this is from Balakot. This one has an inscription on the inside. Now, inscribing something on the inside means that nobody can read it. The only person who knows what's written is the person who's wearing it. But the script on the inside is worn. So it's been worn from actually rubbing against the arm. And I think that maybe this script may have some ritual meaning. So when you're wearing something with it writing and it's touching your body, then you are benefiting from that script and whatever that script says. So this is something that also needs to be explored and trying to figure out if there's a pattern in other regions. Stoneware bangles were also inscribed, but they were inscribed on the outside in a very, very small way. So this was done after firing. Uh, again, nobody could read this from a distance, so this inscription may have some specific significance to the person who's wearing it, but it was not meant for somebody else to see. Um, just in understanding stoneware bangles also is critical because we know that many bangles were made in Mohenjo-daro and traded to Harappa, or I mean, I'm sorry, made it and traded to Harappa, so all of the yellow dots here are found at Harappa but they were made from clay at Mohenjo-daro. Whereas many, none of the bangles from made at Harappa were traded to Mohenjo-daro. So this indicates directionality of movement of certain commodities during this period. Um, bangles were also the only example, shell bangles are the only example of materials buried with the dead um, that were, have, have a specific pattern. And at Harappa we see many female figurine, female individuals with bangles on their left arm. And I've talked about this in many of uh, my lectures, but it's important to note that the earlier burials have wider bangles, the later burials have thinner bangles, which I argue indicates that the women who were buried in the later period were probably not doing a lot of manual labor. Okay. These thin bangles are too fragile for people to actually do things like chop wood or dig ditches or do heavy manual labor. So these women were probably very elite and were not involved in heavy, heavy labor. The wide bangles that I had talked about earlier have been found in other uh, parts of the site, but not in the cemetery. And this one male is one of the few examples of a few ornaments found buried with, the, with a man. Uh, these are very old beads. They have been worn and the inside drill hole is heavily braided um, so it cl it's clear some, that these were things that could not be given to somebody else. They had to be buried with this individual. And that suggests to me that they probably had some special ritual meaning that could not be transferred to somebody else. And one of the beads that he was wearing is made from a stone that we know comes from Kutch. So this stone is found at near Dolavira, and we found a blocklet of it from the workshop in Mound E. And then the finished bead was found in the burial in the cemetery. So this links certain regions to Harappa and then to workshops in the city and then individuals who were buried. Now, we don't know if the man who was buried with that bead came from Gujarat or if he just had some relatives or relationships, business relationships with the region, but this is an important thing that we can study in the future. The cemetery at Harappa is also an important a place where we can look at the role of communities living in these cities, who they were. We know from strontium isotope analysis of the teeth that the people living in the cemetery, buried in the cemetery, some of them were born and raised at Harappa, but many of them were not. 
Many of the men came from outside, and some of the women were from outside. So this indicates that Harappan cities were places where people from outside regions of the Indus Valley, within the Indus Valley, but from not from Harappa, were coming and moving and interacting and intermarrying. More studies of this type need to be done in order to better understand migration patterns and movements of people and exchanges across the greater region. Uh, the final point is that the, the cemeteries do represent social hierarchy, meaning that these people in the Harappan cemetery are elites, but it's very important to emphasize that only certain people of the Indus cities were buried. So we don't have very many cemeteries of the Indus, and we don't have very many people in the cemeteries. This suggests that most people living in the Indus cities were not buried. They were cremated, or they were exposed, or they were put in the river, but they were not buried in the normal way that, in the ground. So only certain communities were buried, and they are one group of Harappan elites. The other groups of Harappan elites who were also wearing ornaments, who were also using Harappan pottery, who were living in the cities, were buried in a different way, which suggests that ritual was highly diverse in Indus cities. It wasn't a single religion. It wasn't a single religious community or an ideological community. And we do have some idea that the people in the Harappa cemetery were hereditarily related because the women are more related to each other than the men in the cemetery. This all changes during the late Harappan, in some regions, not in all regions. So at Harappa, we have a change in ideology, but not so much a change in the actual technology of making pottery or making beads. We have changes in networks. Shell from the coast was no longer coming to this region. We have a breakdown in interaction, but people did not disappear. People did not leave Harappa. Harappa continued to be occupied at a very high level during the late Harappan period. We have a house built with bricks that were locally made at Harappa during the late Harappan, so they were not just scrounging bricks from older buildings. We have a bead pot that was found with lots of beads in it that indicate the use of certain styles of technology for the late Harappan period. We can see that the faience production during the late Harappan was extremely fine and highly refined. We see new styles of beads being produced. We see new styles of drilling, which is tubular drilling, that had started in the Harappan period, but now becomes quite widespread during the late Harappan. So all these, cha these changes and continuities indicate a, a complex process of transformation. It's not the end of the Indus cities, but the beginning of a new transition. So I want to conclude by just saying that since we can't read the Indus script, the Indus archaeology is restricted to the fragmentary and incomplete archaeological record to try and look for evidence of integration and diversity, and ornaments are an important indicator of this integration and diversity. We need more studies of the physical structures of where ornaments were found, so the earlier excavations did not record things in great detail, so we need much more of that to better understand patterns in the, in the cities. We also need to compare the styles of ornaments with other artifacts found in the cities. So ornaments found with patterns of, of pottery and patterns of figurines and seals and food habits. These are things which we need to compare with the ornament traditions. We also need more studies of technology. How were these ornaments produced and how were they modified? It's through this that we will help begin to understand a bit more about the complex role these had within the Indus cities.